And friends, we are continuing along in our series in the book of Colossians, and we are beginning to turn the corner and come to the end of this wonderful book. And it's been a tremendous and wonderful journey for us and our scripture reading here today as we begin to look in uh, towards the end and the finish line of this book comes to us in Colossians chapter 4. I'll be reading from verse 2 to verse 6, so please give your undivided attention. This is God's word for us today, Colossians 4, starting with verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And this is God's word for us and for our lives and souls, friends. Well, it is somewhat poetic and appropriate that as we begin a new calendar year, that the Apostle Paul in the passage I've, I've read comes to a close and summarizes what he considers to be the Christian life. So he begins to wrap up what the Christian life looks like as we begin a new year in 2021. And I want to say this, that what Paul is trying to give us in these verses 2 through 6 is basically what he considers to be a Christian normality a common Christian everyday life. These are practices and applications and encouragements that Paul gives us, and he assumes that they are actually an everyday natural occurrence. It's a normal everyday Christian life. And so he summarizes everything that he said, especially beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, and he summarizes and he wraps it up and he encapsulates everything in what he considers to be a normal, ongoing Christian life. And so I want to consider with you here today what that normal Christian life looks like. And the passage is broken up for us very simply and very clearly. In verses 2 to 4, we have one section. And then secondly, we have verses 5 to 6, which is basically Paul's second section. And so that will comprise our message here today. And the normal Christian life is essentially this. Paul says basically in verses 2 to 4, a Christian life is about praying. A Christian life is a praying life. And then secondly, in the broad heading, verses 5 to 6, a Christian life is a witnessing life. And so all of this really is teaching us how we ought to engage the world by praying, but also by witnessing. The pastor, Alistair Begg, has summarized these verses by saying essentially this, that in verses 2 to 4, is talking to God about people. And then verses 5 to 6 is talking to people about God. So in prayer, we talk to God about people. In our witness, we talk to people about God. And so I want to look at what this may mean for us here today. So let's look at this together in these two broad headings. Verse, verses 2 to 4, we'll look at prayer, talking to God about people, because the Apostle Paul in the church is always praying for people within the church, within the community, our world, and the culture. And he says there, verse 2, very quickly, he says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Now, I want to ask a simple basic question. If you've grown up in the church, you may think you know the answer, but it's not as easy as you may originally think. What is prayer? If I ask that question, what is prayer? What does that word mean there in verse 2? Continue steadfastly in prayer. And I want to say this, that prayer basically means conversation. In its most simple sense, simple definition, it means to ask, to ask something of God. That's what prayer means. Not even in the Bible, but if you just look it up in the dictionary, prayer is asking things from someone. Word there for prayer in verse 2 is the word for prayer that could mean any type of prayer, but most commonly in the New Testament, it's a word that means petitioning, asking. It's a word that really gives a sense of what we ask and plead for God. It's a petition. And so when we think about what prayer is, perhaps we could look to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and in question 98, it answers it for us, and this is what prayer is. The question says, what is prayer? And it says, prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will, in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins, 
and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. And it's a wonderfully succinct answer there that the Bible gives us and undergirds this. But in the answer to what is prayer, there are basically four things. We give our desires and things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ, confession of our sins, and with thankful acknowledgement. But even in this shorter catechism, the thrust of what prayer is, is an offering up of our desires. Confession of sin and thanksgiving, things agreeable to his will, are essential, but there's sort of even you know, an addendum to the main thrust of what prayer is, which is offering things to God, our desires asking things for God. And Paul says there in verse 2, continue steadfastly in this, in asking things of God, offering up your desires, but your desires that should be in, agreeable, in agreement with God's will. In other words, friends, this is what Paul is saying normal Christian life, continue steadfastly in prayer. In other words, make it a habit. It's a lifestyle. Prayer should be so much a natural rhythm and flow to the way that you operate and think. Prayer is your natural habitat, is your natural habit, is your natural tendency in default mode. Persist in prayer. Be devoted to this. An anonymous hymn writer has captured it well when it said this, prayer is the Christian's native breath. And I'm afraid, friends, that even though it should be our natural way to breathe, a natural way to gain life, that many of us, spiritually speaking, have asthma. Prayer is the Christian's native breath, but far too many of us have a coughing fit, and we have a spiritual asthma. But prayer, friends, according to Paul, especially in this new year, 2021, is what makes life work. Now, that's what it says. It, that's what the Bible conveys. Now, if you think about the context of this passage, it makes life work because it's not a coincidence that Paul ends on prayer after a long list of challenging commands. Now, this is just a sampling because a long list of commands begins in chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. But this is what Paul says very quickly. In chapter 3, verse 2, he says, set your mind on things above. And then he says in verse 5 of chapter 3, put to death what is earthly in you. And then he says in chapter 3, verse 10, put on your new self, which is Jesus Christ. And then in verse 15 of chapter 3, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. And then we looked at this last week. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, be ready to love your wives. Children, obey your parents in everything. Parents, don't make your children angry. Bond servants, listen and obey your masters in everything. And masters, treat your servants and bond servants just and fairly. It's a long list, and that's barely scratching the surface of what Christianity has to say. There are even other harder verses, friends. If you know your Bible, turn the other cheek, give your cloak, be merciful, act justly, walk mercifully, mercifully. And so we look at all these commandments. They're really difficult. Give your money away to the kingdom. Love your enemies. And Paul is saying these commandments, the natural normal Christian life can only flow in a well-oiled machine of a Christian life to the degree that you persist and that you continue steadfastly in prayer. Prayer is what makes life work. Paul understands that Christian life can be hard, but the way to get through all of this is going to be through prayer. Even in these verses, when you look at chapter 4 our text today, he doesn't make a transition to prayer. He just gets right into it, saying that it's very adam- he's very adamant, it's very terse. So in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Masters, treat your bond service justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And then in verse 2, there's almost no transition. He says this, continue steadfastly in prayer. Now, it's just so common. It's so integrated into the Christian life. Do all these things, continue steadfastly in prayer. The great reformer Martin Luther stated it this way, to be a Christian without prayer is no more plausible than to be alive without breathing. In other words, you can't call yourself a Christian if not in your natural habitat, if you don't know in the natural way that you live, in the natural habitat, in your natural persistent way of life, in your natural habits, you're not a praying person. Because prayer, in some ways, is the pinnacle expression of someone who understands what it means to be Christian. Friends, let me dig into this a little bit more for you. 
prayer is communication, and we ask things from God. But if you think about communication and your prayer life, to kind of keep it in perspective, some of you are really great at communicating, and some of you talk a lot. So you can tell when two people who are close friends and they begin to speak with one another. You can notice you're saying they have history. It's so common. It's so natural. It flows really well. Two people who just have known each other for years and have been close, their conversation flows. And in some ways, that's how our prayer life should be. But I think that if you're honest with yourselves in our church, you don't look at prayer as a natural communication, a common expression, a natural habitat. I think that many people in the church use prayer as a 911 call. It's an emergency hotline. Or many of you use prayer simply as a genie in a bottle. You turn to God in prayer when there is an emergency, or maybe you turn to God as a genie in the bottle because you have this new dream, this aspiration that you just really desperately hope could happen, and then you pray to God. And certainly you could pray all that in emergencies. Definitely pray to God. And if you have dreams and hopes and aspirations, you also lift that up to God. But prayer is not supposed to just be a lifeline or an emergency call, and it's not just one of three wishes. Prayer is supposed to be a natural conversation between two people who are so intimately close, a daily conversation. Friends, let me ask you a question: Is your prayer like that, a natural, common conversation, something that flows well, or is prayer essentially your 911 call, an emergency hotline? Or your genie in a bottle. You know what sort of relationship do you have with God in your prayer life? Now I'm sort of dating myself, but there was this old movie、um, called Meet the Parents, and in the in this one scene in Meet the Parents, the main actor Ben Stiller plays、uh, this fiance, and he has dinner with his fiance's parents. And at the dinner table, the parents ask、uh, Ben Stiller's character, "Why don't you say grace for us?" And automatically, you could tell that he doesn't pray. He doesn't know how to pray, but this is his prayer. I can't do justice to it, so you could go ahead and YouTube it. But it's completely awkward. In the middle of his prayer, everyone opens up their eyes. They look over to Ben Stiller's character. They're saying, "What in the world is he saying?" He says it in a way that's awkward and slow, as if he's making it up as he goes along. And this is what his prayer is. And I'm just going to read it to you really quickly. This is what he says: "Oh dear God." Thank you. You are such a good God to us, a kind and gentle and accommodating God, and we thank you, O、oh、sweet, sweet Lord of Hosts, for the smorgasbord that you have so aptly laid out at our table this day, and each day, by day, day by day, by day, O、oh、dear Lord, three things we pray: to love Thee more dearly, to see Thee more clearly, to follow Thee more nearly. Day by day, by day, Amen. Now, when you read that prayer, the content actually is pretty good. It's not a bad prayer. The problem is, is that when he says it, you could tell that he's talking to a stranger. And what Paul is trying to get to us in the normal Christian life is not just to have biblically robust prayer, but he's saying it should be a conversation that's natural, not awkward. It's not two strangers who meet at the bus stop, but it's supposed to be best friends, almost to the point where it's a father and son who talk so clearly, naturally, and well. Pastor Tim Keller has said this about people's prayer lives. He says many people will pray when they are required by cultural or social expectations, or perhaps by the anxiety caused by troubling circumstances. Those with a genuinely lived relationship with God as Father, however, innerly want to pray and therefore will pray even though nothing on the outside is pressing them to do so. Keller is trying to say this: people who really understand the Christian life. Pray naturally because they want to talk to God. They know their life is utterly dependent upon God the Father. They always ask God in every moment of their lives to express their dependence. You see, friends, it is sort of going against the grain of natural humanity to pray more, because in humanity, biologically, as a child begins to grow, that child goes into adolescence. Into their college life, young adulthood, it begins middle age, and as the child grows older, the child becomes less dependent upon the parents. They ask mom and dad for less and less things. 
But in the Christian life, it works the other way around. The more mature you get in your Christian life, the more dependent you become upon God. The more mature you're in the Christian life, the more you ask things from God. So you don't get pressed from the outside, as Keller alluded to, when there's a circumstance or there's a dream, but you pray to God because you realize that's your sweetest joy and moment and conversation. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Now, really briefly, as we look at verses uh, 2 to 4, there are a couple of things that Paul says to kind of nuance his prayer life. In verse 2, secondly, he also says, be watchful in it. So when you pray, pray for your life. Be alert. You know, be watchful of your life and your culture. And what he means by that is saying, when you pray, that's the best way to reflect upon your temptations, your sins, your tendencies, to look at the deeper realities of your life. He says, be watchful, be perceptive, be intense. So when you pray, a lot of times you pray for your life because in that moment, prayer is what reveals your life. You could be watchful in it. You could be alert. You're saying, I am honest about my idols here. I'm honest about my jealousy. I'm honest about my fears, my anxieties, my disappointment. Prayer allows you in this grace to be much more contemplative and deeper. So he says in verse 2, being watchful in it. So continue steadfastly, devote yourself to prayer, but you could be reflective of your life. Be watchful in it. Let me give you an example of what that may mean. Paul Miller, in his book, A Praying Life, gives an example of what this could look like. And he takes an everyday circumstance, an everyday reality, I guess, of buying a house. And this is how he describes it when people, an average person like you and me, an average American, buys a house. We ask questions like this. Can we afford the house? Will it be too much work? Is it a good school district? Should we make an offer on the house? What sort of offer should we make? And all those friends are really good questions. You have to ask those questions. But when you're praying and you want to be watchful in your prayer life and you want to be thoughtful about your prayer life and you're going to pray, should I buy this house or not? Paul Miller says this, we seldom ask God heart questions. Heart questions such as, Will this home breed pride in my life? Will this home isolate us from other people? Will it help us be more faithful in attending church? Will it be helpful to the church? Can I use this house for the church in the greater kingdom? You see the difference in the two questions and the two ways to pray? See, he says in the first set, God is basically your financial advisor and real estate agent. But in the second set of questions, God is your Lord. Be watchful in your prayer life. And you can think about this. You could be reflective in your prayer life, not just in buying a house, but in every aspect of your life. It's not just about getting your children to study hard and to be number one at school sports or to eat their vegetables or to sleep well, but to think more deeply, am I getting prideful in my kids' performance? Am I idolizing my children? Am I living vicariously through my children? It's not just to pursue a job to say, is this the next natural step in my career? Is this a place where finally I feel like I get an annual salary that I think I'm worth, or it has a good benefit plan? But you have to ask deeper questions to be prayerful but watchful in it, to reflect upon your next stage in your career. Then you can apply this to everything. In every aspect of your life, you breathe out prayer because it's so integrated in the normal Christian life. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us. Paul Miller continues and he says, your heart is one of God's biggest mission fields because we don't think and are reflective or watchful. When we pray and say, your kingdom come, we're praying that Jesus would really rule my life, and that's what we're trying to pray. That's what we're trying to get through. Your heart may be one of the biggest mission fields for God's grace to reach. And prayer, according to the Apostle Paul, is a way that we could be watchful about our lives and our tendencies, our temptations, to be reflective, that he wants us to know these are our potential idols. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say. And lastly, in this prayer, what does Paul pray for specifically? He asks for a prayer request. is right there. In verse 3, he says, pray for us that the gospel may go out. In verse 4, he says, pray that the gospel could be clear. He's praying for evangelism. How do you engage the world? Paul here is most likely in prison, and the greatest burden upon his heart while Paul is in house prison is that the gospel may go out to the world. 
Friends, maybe that's just a simple prayer request that we can consider here today, individually and as a church. Is there a family member? Is there a coworker? Is there a neighbor in your neighborhood? Is there a family of your kids' sports? Is there someone that you know doesn't know Jesus? And maybe that's just a simple prayer request that you can lift up. Open a door. Open a door to have a conversation. Open a door to have a moment to share why my life is a little bit different. Open a door so that the message of the Word of God has an opportunity to reach and touch the life of someone who has no idea who Jesus is. That's how the Apostle Paul wants us to pray. It's amazing that Paul asks this because if I was in prison, there'd probably be so many things I'd pray for. Pray for freedom, pray for comfort, pray that I could live a bit longer, pray that I could get out of the chains. I would pray for so many other things, but what Paul shows us is that what burdens his heart is that he prays for the gospel to go out. So friends, in 2021, when you look at the first part of what a normal Christian life is, a normal Christian life is a praying life. It is your breath. As St. Ambrose has once said, he says, prayer is the way that our souls reach the heights of heaven to get a taste of who God is. That is supposed to be natural for us, as natural it is for us to walk and to move, that we spiritually move in this rhythm and flow that the Apostle Paul calls prayer. And secondly, what is a natural Christian life in this world? It's our witness, our evangelism. Read with me verses 5 to 6. Paul says it very simply. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This is his description of a normal Christian life. For the church, people like you, me, followers of Jesus, how we can relate to outsiders. And that's not, that seems like such like, you know, exclusive language, but he just basically means those who are not believers, those who are not Christian. And he's saying, this is how you can begin to win people over to Christ, how you can engage, how you can enjoy, how you can relate to non-Christians in every area of your life. Because they say in evangelism that if you just think about your various spheres of existence in this world, you can more intentionally compartmentalize and be intentional about who you could pray about to engage and to witness to. They always say there's your neighborhood, literally, physically, geographically, your neighbors in the neighborhood and the complex that you live. There's your work area, there's your recreation area, and there's your education area. So you have all these spheres of influence and you could take it one at a time and pray for someone to say, how can I witness? How can I engage? How can I relate to someone in the way that Paul tells us in verses five to six? Now he gives us very succinctly two aspects of our witness to the non-believing world And the two aspects and the two things to our witness is this, our walking and then our words, our walk and talk, or our walk and our words. So let's look at this. How do we walk and how do we talk? What is it in the way that we walk and move and live our lives? And what is it in the way that we talk and the speech of our lives? Because he's saying basically your word and deed are going to be the most powerful initial impact to witness to people about the grace and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. So let's look at this a little bit. Our walk. That's Paul's favorite metaphor. Walk is moving from point A to point B. It's how you live your life. It's how you move. Paul is specific here, and he's talking about how we walk in relationship to the world. How do you walk in relationship to the world? Now, some of you, you walk because you walk too closely. You walk in a way that you are married to the world. And some of you are walking, but you're in an entirely different street from the world that you have no engagement for the world. And you don't want to do either way. You don't want to go to the extremes. You don't want to walk in a way that you're doing marriage life with the world. On the other hand, you don't want to walk with the world that you're isolated. You have to walk in a way that's winsome engagement, a friendliness and an alertness with the world. Our lives, in other words, the way Paul talks about this, is that our walk with the world should be wise, Let's talk about wisdom. That word there is where we get the word uh, Sophia. It's wisdom. The Bible has wisdom throughout. How do you walk with the world wisely? And this is what Paul's trying to talk about. Wisdom. In its most basic sense in the Old Testament in Proverbs or throughout the Old Testament, the word wisdom basically means skill. 
and it's used in different aspects of life. That word wisdom, translated as skill, is used in war, is used in government, is used in politics. And in biblical gospel wisdom, it's talking about the skill to navigate and master life. See, wisdom is tough because it's not a formula. You can't learn wisdom through figuring out an algorithm. So, computer programmers, you're not going to be able to figure wisdom out. Wisdom is much more organic. Wisdom is much more about a relationship and less about mechanics and less about following a set of rules. Wisdom, in other words, friends, is what the Bible likes to call a mastery of life. A mastery of life. Wisdom, in other words, is a mastery over your experiences of knowing yourself and people in a situation. Wisdom is a mastery over your relationships and community. And wisdom is such a an important reality that all of us desperately want wisdom, but it's so hard to learn how to grow to be wise. And so when Paul says walk in wisdom towards outsiders, we have to know what wisdom is. Maybe one way you could understand it this way: that wisdom. Is related to knowledge, but wisdom is also more than knowledge, because you can have some of the most knowledgeable people, but at the same time they're most foolish. You can have people who are really great academics, but they have no mastery of life, because if knowledge is what you know, biblical wisdom is how you see what you know. How do you arrange what you know? How do you organize what you know in a coherent biblical framework so that you can pick and choose and see things with clarity and navigate life with minimal difficulty? That's what wisdom is. See, many people confuse this. They confuse knowledge and intellect with wisdom. Wisdom is more than knowledge, but it also presupposes knowledge. See, the difference is that somebody who's intelligent could get an A plus on an exam. But a wise person can take that knowledge of the exam and apply it, apply it to their different aspects of life. A witty and winsome person, a quick-thinking person, could be maybe the best person at an escape room. But that person may be completely a prisoner in the world out there because he's foolish. Because there's a very big difference between wisdom and knowledge. And this is the beauty, friends. You can tell. When a person is wise, you can see this just by the way they live their lives, by observing them, by listening to them, by talking to them. This is a description of what a wise person is. A wise person sees reality for what it truly is. A wise person has the ability to see things for what they really are. They know the right thing to say at the right time. They know when to fight. They know when to pull back. They know when to speak and when to close their mouths and listen. They know how to handle money. They understand the use of money, the power of money, the temptation of money. They know how to make money. A wise person, they have a teachable heart. A wise person is teachable, moldable. A wise person is compassionate and empathetic. They love reproof and being corrected. They love rebuke. A wise person stores up God's word in their heart. They understand people and situations. And so they know how to handle difficult people. They know how to respond in awkward circumstances. They come to an emergency and they can figure out what to do because they understand the realities of life. In sum, they know God, they know themselves, they know people, and they know the world. That's wisdom, and wisdom can only become come to us. We can only grow in wisdom for the one person in the world who was the perfect wise man. The one person in the world who actually the Bible tells us is wisdom from God to us, Jesus Christ. You see, friends, you can't necessarily study wisdom in terms of looking at a textbook. You have to have and cultivate a relationship with knowing God in prayer, in life, in His Word, and you cultivate a relationship with God so that naturally, as you hang out with Jesus, you become wise like Him. You have a mastery over life. And what Paul is saying, this, when you engage your neighbor in the world out there, he's very intentional. Walk in wisdom with outsiders. You know, isn't that just fascinating? He doesn't say with outsiders as you engage, walk valiantly. He doesn't say walk with a superior notion. 
He doesn't say when you engage non-Christians, he doesn't say out of all the things he could have chosen, walk in power, walk as if you're better, walk if you're smarter, walk if you're more accomplished, walk if you're richer. There's so many ways. He says very winsomely, wisely walk with wisdom with outsiders. He chose wisdom as the one and only characteristic of how our lives should be primarily in the normal Christian life with your neighbor. To walk wisely when you engage with somebody at Starbucks. Walk wisely when you go to the mall. Walk wisely as you're going through the drive through at your restaurant. Walk wisely as you go on vacation, as you go camping. He says in the one characteristic, the one flavor that should flavor your life and walk is going to be wisdom. Not power, not riches. Now, obviously, that's a part of it. He doesn't even say love, even though that's the greatest commandment in the Bible. Now, obviously, that's part of it. You've got to love your neighbor. That's throughout the Bible. But here, he specifically chose at this city called Colossae, which is a very urban center, walk wisely. Walk wisely as you engage with them. In some ways, friends, the rest of verses 5 to 6 they just describe what a wise person looks like. It says, a wise person makes the best use of time. In other words, a wise person makes best and use of every opportunity. Now, be careful here. He doesn't say a wise person is opportunistic. Opportunistic people are sort of selfish, self-centric. You know, they're just trying to, you know, there's a fine line. But he does say make use of every opportunity. In other words, buy the time. A wise person understands the preciousness of time, and he's not talking about like what many Westerners consider. He's not saying that you have to be utterly productive and utterly efficient and actually who produces the most. He's not talking about that. He's just saying in the gospel economic, in a kingdom paradigm, that you make the best use of time. That's what a wise person does. He makes the best use of every opportunity. Now, I'm reminded of a quote by Francis Chan. He said this, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Our greatest fear should not be of failing at things, he says, but of succeeding at things that don't really matter. You know why? Because the Christian life, a wise person who engages the world, they have to redeem the time, make the best use of the time. And so that gives us a lot of perspective and paradigm about how we're using our time. Are we in this rhythm and flow that the gospel wants us and encourages us to live by? But it also says there in verses 5 to 6, secondly, it's not just about your walking, but it's also about your speaking, your words. And a wise person has gracious speech and knows how to answer each person. By the way, it shows that a wise person understands people because it says you have an answer for each person which means that every person is different. And a wise person knows how to respond. You know, it's interesting. So even sometimes in life or maybe at church, you know, there's, uh, at church, there's a lot of different personalities. There are strong, aggressive, uh, sort of like lion-hearted people. You know, they're, they're just natural leaders and they come strong at you and they bark at you and they, you know, they have all these ideas and they're just assertive. Nothing wrong with this. It's just naturally how they're built. And then you have some people who are very quiet and meek and you never really know what they're thinking and you're trying to figure out how is the best way to serve them and to lead them and to pastor them. And in some ways you have diverse personalities and I realize that on some level of my personal experience, there are times where the lion-hearted people, the aggressive leaders who come at me strong, sometimes occasionally I'll try to say as winsomely as I can, as your pastor, I believe that the Bible says this for your life. Because people who are aggressive, powerful, successful, they're not necessarily used to having someone tell them what to do. And on the other hand, for the people who are meek, and they basically look to elders or leaders and pastors to tell them what to do in every decision of their life, I feel that wisdom dictates to me to tell them, well, what do you think the Bible says? How do you think you should make this decision? And what Paul is telling us here is saying, that you would have an answer for each person because everyone is different. Everyone has a different temptation. Everyone has a different life experience. Everyone has a different demographic. Everyone has a different potential heart issue. Everyone has a different gift set and natural temperament and makeup. And the Apostle Paul is saying, a wise person in your speech, you know how to answer each person. 
as you engage the world. Wise person has gracious speech on how to answer each person. A wise person has words that are seasoned with salt. Now, what does it mean to be seasoned with salt? Well, it's used in the Gospels as well. But seasoned with salt probably just means that either one, salt back in the day was a preservative. You know, they didn't have refrigerators, so it preserved meat. So when you have words seasoned with salt, that means you have words that are life-giving, that preserve life and not necessarily corrupt speech or talking. But according to uh, one, one person, Plutarch, he said that actually salt was the crowning season it was a crowning season. It was, I guess he meant by that, it was the one flavor that everyone thought was the best, the crowning season. And that's why commentators will say this. In your speech, that season with salt is talking about gracious, warm, and winsome words. See, out of all the ways that the, the Bible and Paul could have said, as you gauge the world, this is how you ought to talk, he doesn't say once again, talk aggressively. You know, it doesn't say give them a theological lecture. He doesn't say when you talk and talk and engage the, your neighbor in the world, non-believers, with your speech. He doesn't say be quiet 100% of the time. He doesn't say be aggressive 100% of the time. He doesn't say talk in a way that's flowery and you know, theological or philosophical, erudite. No, he just says basically talk with salt. Gracious, warm and winsome words. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Friends, words have power. My guess would be if I asked you right now, when was the last time you were angry? When was the last time you were angry? When was the last time you were hurt? When was the last time you felt hurt? My guess would be it was from, so, it was from what someone has said to you in their words. If I said, when was the last time you got hurt? It's probably not going to be someone throwing a stick or stone at you. Because as they say, stick and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I think many of us will probably take a stick and a stone 10 times out of 10 out of a hard word that stays with us for the rest of our lives. Many of you, I would imagine, still have a moment, no matter how old you are, you have a moment when you were a child and your mom or dad said something to you and it still sticks with you, and it stings, and it hurts, and it shaped you, and it made you a certain way that you are today. Because words have power. They have the power of life and death. Words speak of relationship and community. Words could be a, res a result of a deadly tongue that disrupts and destroys community, but words can heal. Words can soothe the soul. And that's what the Apostle Paul says. Friends, if you try to summarize the way that our words should be, is winsome, gracious, warm, kind, and real words. Real meaning that you can engage the world. When you talk to a non-believer, there's a moment where you could talk about the gospel and evangelize, but you don't always have to be on your pulpit when you talk to non-believers. You could just be real about life, be a human being, but be warm, gracious, and winsome in your words. The New Testament scholar James Dunn has described it this way. He says that the church is expected to hold its own in the social setting of the marketplace, baths, and meal table, and to win attention by the attractiveness of its life and speech. Life and speech, your walk and your words. And friends, I believe we can do this in 2021, this everyday, normal, steadfast Christian life in the way we pray, the way we witness, in the way we walk, in the way we speak. If we look to Jesus Christ, the one who has spoken into our lives, who is wisdom for us, the one by whose name we can pray to God, Jesus Christ who actually was, according to John chapter 1, the way God spoke to us in the Logos. Ken Hughes once said this about Christ, Jesus is the alphabet of God or he is the ABCs of deity. God has spoken finally and climactically into you, into your life. He died on the cross for you. He rose again. He forgave your sins and gave you a new life. If we look at how God spoke to us in his son, if we looked at the alphabet of deity, if we looked at the ABCs of God, then we can become what Paul tells us here, a praying people, a wise people, 
and a people who have words that are seasoned with salt. And so friends, I pray that your words will have a lot of salt in there, that you pour a lot of salt on your conversations and your words so that you can engage the world in a way that could witness and win people over to Christ. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer, friends. Lord, as we continue to live this life and as we think, Father God, about how we can live a life that glorifies you, we thank you for your word. Oh Lord, we pray that you teach us to pray, to have a natural conversation, to offer up our desires that are things, our desires which you pray will be agreeable to your will. We pray that prayer would be the habitat and the habit of our lives. Lord, we pray that prayer would be our love and our sweet moment that we could find communion with you, God. And Lord, we pray that we can engage the world in our witness, that we can live in a way that is wise and speak in a way that is winsome. We pray that we do all this so that a door could be opened up so the gospel can go forth and touch the hearts of people who are spiritually lost in this world. We thank you so much, Lord God, for your word once again, and we pray all these things in Jesus Christ. Amen.